maybe if I have a little bit of time, I can show you a little bit of new data that, that collaborates both of that problem. And so I think the title was very general, high resolution membrane protein structure, so that, that means the structure for point zero, but there's nothing else. <laughs> But anyway, so what I'm going to talk about is the structure of the membrane junction formed by upper point zero. And just to give you a very broad introduction, so upper points are this large family of membrane proteins that form in two different classes. There are a few upper points down here which form membrane pores, which are very, very specific for water and don't allow the conduction of anything else. In addition, we have a second cluster of here, the upper glycerophorins, and these proteins, in addition to allowing transport of water, also permeable to small nutrisodiums such as urea and glycerol. And these proteins became rather famous recently when Peter you know, Auger was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering these proteins. And since the discovery of aquaporin 1, which was the first water force, you found these proteins in almost every organism there is. So all these proteins have pretty much the same sequence, and in the meantime, there are a lot of structures determined for different aquaporins, and they all share a very similar three-dimensional pose. So despite the fact that all these proteins pretty much look the same, we, will, we still wanted to look at one more aquaporin, and this was aquaporin zero here. And the reason we wanted to look at this particular aquaporin was that at the time when we started to look at this, it was the only aquaporin that was able to form membrane junctions. So it was the only aquaporin which, in addition of being a, a, a transporter or a membrane pole, had an established secondary function as a membrane adhesion molecule. And so in the meantime, it's actually not the only one anymore. Aquaporin pole had also been shown to form membrane junctions. So <coughs> Aquaporin zero, you find in the lens of the eye, and aquaporin zero is a very specific aquaporin. So most aquaporins you actually find in many different tissues, and many different tissues have actually many different aquaporins. So most aquaporins are ubiquitous, but aquaporin zero is only found in the lens, and in the lens it's actually only found in the fiber So it's a very, very specific aquaporin. And the lens here has basically two functions. The first function is that it has to be transparent, so basically, you just want to focus light, incoming light, onto the back of the eye at the retina so that you can form an image. The second function the lens has is that it has to accommodate. And what this means is that the shape of the lens has to change depending whether you look at an object which is very close to the eye or whether you look at an object which is very far away from the eye. So you need to change the, the, the shape of the lens and that's called accommodation. And so to do these two functions, the lens has a very specific building plan. It consists of a single layer of epithelial cells in the front of the lens. And at this, these two points, the up and down, they actually start to differentiate into so-called fiber cells which span the entire width of the lens. And during this differentiation from the epithelial cell to the fiber cell, a lot is happening. And the most dramatic um, differentiation is that these fiber cells actually lose all of their organelles. And simply they do this so we don't have light scattering the light go through the, through the lens. And if this differentiation not only occurs during embryogenesis when the lens is formed, but it continues throughout the lifespan of an organism. And these older fiber cells don't get degraded, but they get compacted into the center of the lens. And so some of the older cells that we have in our body you can actually find right in the middle of the lens. Now, <coughs> Uh, as I mentioned, aquaporin zero is not just a water form, it's a specific water form, it's not an aquaporin. But in addition to being a water form, it makes membrane junctions. And so this is a thin section to the lens, and these would be neighboring fiber cells here, and you can see large areas of these membranes engaging in junction formation. And a lot of these junctions are the big junctions here, which are formed by connections, so there are actually gap junctions. But if you look next to these gap junctions, you have the thin junctions here. And these thin junctions are actually formed by aquaporin zero. And if you do instead of this thin fraction, and you do some pre structure studies, you can see that large areas of these junction membranes are actually covered by square arrays. And you can see as well, if you zoom in a little bit, you can see very nice that it's a square array. And if you calculate the fluid transform, you can even see the fraction. So it's very well ordered. So basically, the question we had was now, how is this structure formed? How do you actually form membrane junctions out of aquaporin zero? And so to do this, we simply um, purified aquaporin zero, 
And what I should mention is that in this differentiation from um, young fibro cells to old fibro cells, a lot has happened to the membrane proteins as well. So for example, in the case of point zero, in the young fibro cells, you express the full length protein. So if you purify point zero from the cortex, which you do just by solubilizing the membranes in 1% desomorphoside, and then anion exchange and filtration. <coughs> so if you purify from the young fibro cells to the cortex, you get full length protein. If you now purify using exactly the same protocol from the core of the lens, we get a mixture of full length protein and cleaved protein. And that's an aging process. So upper point zero, as it ages, it gets into the core of the lens, gets cleaved to both termini, the N and the C terminals. And so with structure biologists, we like to have homogeneous samples, so we started to actually look at upper point zero um, isolated from the cortex, so we have a single nice preparation of full length protein. And when we did this, we reconstituted it with dialysis. I hope there are other methods of improvement in school. <laughs> but anyway, so we used dialysis, and when we used the full length protein, we actually get very nice reconstitution in the PMPC. And if you, can, if you can maybe see it, you actually can see the letters inside of these membranes. And so this is negative stain. You can see this negative stain. So then we actually embedded in glucose and got some high resolution images by Corinium. And this is a calculated um, CTS plot, as the end just shown this morning. And what we can see are the fractions all the way out to four angstroms. So we collected quite a bunch of these images and merged them together to get a projection map. And this is what we got the projection is by four angstrom resolution. And at this point, we got very, very depressed. And the you help. So the reason we got depressed is because if we compare this projection map with the projection map of Aqua Point One at the roughly the same resolution you can actually match almost every density that we see in alpha point zero with the density in alpha point one. That's a one-to-one -one match. And since we know that alpha point one is a single layer, we knew that we haven't gotten a membrane junction. So this is a single layer crystal. And at this point, we actually almost gave up. But then instead of giving up, because we were really interested not in the structure of yet another alpha point, we really wanted to know the structure of the membrane junction. So we had to try and think and and figure out how we actually can form these double layer TV crystals. And what we knew so far is that when we isolate alpha point zero from the lens cortex, where we have the full length protein, if we reconstitute this into a membrane, we get single layer TV crystals. At the same time, we know that alpha point zero into the core of the lens is actually both C and M terminal cleave. And what we also found when you read the literature, which is good to do every now and again, you actually find that you have more membrane junctions in the core of the lens. And so from that, we actually um, thought it might actually be the cleavage of upper point zero that may induce the formation of a membrane junction. It doesn't exactly make sense because the, the membrane junction formation is on the exosome side, while the cleavage is in the cytoplasm. But still, this was our best guess at this time, and so we wanted to check whether this could really be the case. And so what we did was to um, isolate aqua point zero from the cortex, so we have the full length protein, and we reconstituted it into little bell liquids, and we just did this by increasing the lipid to protein ratio. And so this is how these well liquids look like, they're nicely distributed, and then what we simply did was to throw in some chymotrypsin. And so this is the full length protein included in these well liquids, and when we just simply add some, some chymotrypsin, we can cleave about half of the protein. And the reason we cannot cleave everything is because we know that the protein in these vesicles is right side out. So the, the, the terminal at the end of the C terminal is actually inside of these vesicles. And so we can only cleave the protein if the vesicles are broken, like in this case. But if the vesicles are, are nicely coherent, then we cannot get to the terminal. And so about 50% of the vesicles were broken, and so we could actually call it about 50% of the, of the protein. Now, just to remind you, this is just a little tube with these vesicles, and then we just add chymotrypsin, and there is no centrifugation step, nothing. And just after half an hour, we took the sample and put it on the grid again, 
and this time we find that most of the vesicles is actually aggregated in these large clusters. So what this really means is that it's indeed the cleavage of aquapoint zero termini that induces the formation of, of the membrane junctions. And so what we did now is instead of using aquapoint zero from the cortex, we just purified aquapoint zero from the core, and where we have this mixture of full length protein and field protein. And again, using dialysis, we got very nice two dimensional crystals. I'm right, here is Good. <laughs> <laughs> So we got very nice to the crystal, so this is about one micrometer, so you can see these are several micrometers in diameter. But just to make the case, although this is actually five micrometers, this is a small one, many of them are much bigger, we actually only used about a one micrometer patch to get out the correction pellets. And we got much better quality because at the smaller areas we have more coherent crystals. As we go lo larger, we get more distortions of the lattice and we actually decrease the, the, the quality of the, the diffraction pellets. So we got much bigger crystals than these. But I like to show this because if you look up here, you can actually see two edges. And so already from this raw image negative stain, we know that these are two layers. One layer stops here, and the second layer stops here. So now we really have two layers on top of each other. So is this material both cleaved and uncleaved that eventually went into the vacuum? Yeah, so this is from the core, but we have a mixture of cleaved and uncleaved. So you didn't do any further cleavage? So we actually did. We thought we were clever, so we took all the probes and cleaved the complete of trips and tried to reconstitute them. We got huge membrane stuff. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so we couldn't use this at all. So this was actually clever. And so if you calculate the free transform again, the CTF plot, you can see very nice complete um, diffraction all the way out to four angstroms again. <coughs> and so we collected a bunch of these images, put them together, and this time we were happy because if you compare it to single layer crystals, Aquaporins have a ta are tandem repeats in the sequence, and so the two halves of the protein have a pseudo symmetry. So you get a pseudo mirror axis in the middle of these monomers. But in this case, you actually have a real mirror axis between the two halves of the protein. And as you heard this morning, I'm actually not able to have this in one protein. So what this means, the only way that you can get this if, is if you have two tetramers sitting right on top of each other. And this actually introduces this real mirror axis here. And so, as you probably all know, the way that we get density maps in electron crystallography is by taking images of untilted and tilted specimens, we extract the phases, and then we also take electron diffraction patterns of untilted and tilted specimens from which we extract the, the, the amplitudes, we compare the amplitudes of the phases, calculate the density map, and then the rest is like nectar crystallography. But as you probably all know as well, getting high resolution images is a heck of a lot more difficult than get, getting high resolution intensities or diffraction problems. So we thought we used the same trick X-ray crystallographers do all the time, and it has been done in, in electron crystallography as well. If you look at mutants, namely to try and do molecular replacement, and determine the structure of a new protein with the phases of a similar protein. However, this is a little bit more difficult in electron crystallography because in X-ray crystallography, you get most of the data from one or a few extra 3D crystals. And as you know, in electron crystallography, each crystal gives you one diffraction pattern. So you have to merge a lot of different diffraction patterns from a lot of different crystals. And so the all merge is always fairly poor. And so it wasn't clear whether this all merge or this poor statistics would be enough to actually do molecular replacement. But nevertheless, we tried. And so when, when we do electron diffraction at zero degree, we get very nice diffraction all the way out to three angstrom this time. And also um, when we tilted the specimen actually to 70 degree, because we really wanted to use only the diffraction, so we wanted to have the data set as complete as possible. And by tilting to 70 degree, we could actually minimize the, the missing column. And so even in these, these highly tilted diffraction patterns, we could get very strong diffraction not only along the tilt axis, but also perpendicular to the tilt axis. And so we combined a bunch of these diffraction patterns and indeed did molecular replacement, and Piotr is going to talk about the, the details, how we did this. But by doing this, we really could get a structure of the membrane junction by upper point zero, which is based on three ions from intensity data set. And so the question we set out was really what is different in aquapoint zero from all the other aquapoints that you can make membrane junctions. And the answers here in the middle between these two tetramers 
They make very specific interactions, which are all formed by probably the cities. So there's an interaction right in the middle of this junction, and it's formed by signal amino acid residue uh, proto-38. And this proto-38 from these four monomers in this tetramer come together to make this little ring. The same happens with the proto-38s from this tetramer. And then these two rings come together to make proton protein stacking interactions. So a little bit further out from the center, we have these peripheral interactions. And again, it's actually mainly mediated by proton protein interactions. So this is really the answer to the question that we started with, what is different from point zero from other opponents, and it's these protons which are only conserved in occupants from different species, but not in other opponents. But then what occurred to us is if you take a water pore and you put it into one membrane, and then you take a second water pore and put it in the second membrane, and you put them together, you actually form a cell-to-cell -cell water pathway. Very similar to the idea of connection to gap junctions, where you take one hemichannel and one membrane, you dock it to the second hemichannel and the second membrane, and you get a cell to cell communicative channel. So it's the same thing happening in upper point zero. And so, first, this is upper point one, this is a very efficient water pore. And this is seen from the top, so these would be for membrane of the helices, these are the pore lining residues, and right in the middle, you can see very obvious this is the water pore. Now, if we did the same view with junction of the point zero, you could actually nice to see the transmembrane of the helices, the pore line residues, but to our amazement, the water pore was gone, and we actually didn't believe it at the beginning. This was highly unexpected. Now, based on this finding that this, this, this water pore was gone, we actually proposed that junction of the point zero no longer functions as a water pore, but instead of pure membrane diffusion molecule. So if you have aqua point zero in a single membrane, but you have the full length protein, you have a nice water pore, then you cleave the tails, the N and the C terminus, you induce the formation of the membrane junction, and the membrane junction actually closes the water pore. And one of the things that we proposed at that time is that this is not a pure switch. You don't make a membrane junction, you close the pore. What we proposed is very similar to what is known for long, long time in ion channels, that you have a certain probability that the channel is open, and you have a certain probability that the channel is closed. And once you form a membrane junction, you simply just increase the probability that the pore is in the closed conformation. The problem with water channels is that you can actually narrow this, like an ion channel, where you can have single channel measurements, just simply because water doesn't have any characteristic that you can measure. So on one channel, you can never measure whether the water goes through or not. So, but anyway, so we propose this, that junction of the point zero is actually a closed water pole. But if you really want to do this, and if you really want to claim this, it would be very nice to, to actually visualize the water molecules and say that in full length of the point zero, you have an open water pole filled with water molecules, and in junction of the point zero, the cleave protein, you have a closed water pole, and there are no water molecules. So that will to actually see water molecules, you need a resolution of two and a half angstrom or better. And that's not so easy to do in electron crystallography. And in an ignorant audience, I usually say, so we wanted to get better resolution, so we used a better microscope. And um, both plays every time caused my bluff. So in this, I have to say, since we only work on electron diffraction, we should actually be able to get whatever resolution with our microscope in Boston, because diffraction is much less uh, uh, Okay, so basically, we should be able with our microscope to get to whatever resolution. So, but nevertheless, what we needed was the presence of the high resolution EM gold, and that's Yoshinori Joshi. And so, we took our two equipment and went to Japan to actually take some images and diffraction patterns in, in Japan. And so, we got very nice diffraction patterns with this microscope. And the reason really that we got such, such great resolution was that we certainly had good, good crystals, but what was very essential for this is the preparation method shown by, by Gyogu, the, 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 the carbon sandwich technique, because when we arrived in Japan for a week, we prepared our crystals the same way we did in Boston, 
And the diffraction patterns that we got were really, really poor, much worse than the ones that we collected in, in Boston. And the only ones that we used as new preparation methods that we actually collect data to this very high resolution. And the other advantage on the, of the microscope in Japan was that we had a 4K to 4K CCD, so we could use longer uh, camera length to get much better diffractions, but we could actually get better background. So we got these very nice diffraction patterns, and 3 Angstrom is the data that we used to get the first structure that we collected in Boston. 2.5 Angstrom was at the time the highest resolution diffraction data set, which was collected by Yifan Cheng and Bacteria Dobson, but it's still not published. And in our case, we actually have complete diffraction all the way out to 2 Angstrom resolution. And in many diffraction spots, you can see diffraction spots all the way out to 1.5 angstroms. So what we did was to collect a lot of these diffraction panels from untilted and tilted specimens. We merged the diffraction panels together to about 1.7 angstroms, and then we refined the density map to 1.9 angstroms. And so this is a, a part of the density map, you have seen this before, at 1.9 angstroms, and this is close to the waterfall. And so here's an aromatic residue, this is the neuron name, this is the aromatic ring, and you can see nice with a hole in the middle. Up here we have a tyrosine, again, this is the aromatic ring with the hole, and then we have some extra density here for the hydroxyl group, which is missing in the neuron name. So now you have fairly high resolution, and at this high resolution, at this level of, of, of detail, we can now also quite easily see the water molecules, and these are two water molecules in the water pathway. So if you look at the entire water pathway through the water, through the point zero, this will be the cytoplasmic side, this will be the exocellular side, and this will be the water pathway all the way to the protein. And this water pathway, we only see these three densities here, which are consistent with water molecules. And so if you calculate the pore profile, you can see that in this area above the water molecules and below the water molecules, the water pore is actually too narrow to accommodate water molecules. And only in this area where we can see the water molecules, there's enough space for water molecules to form. Now, in a normal open water pore, you would have 79 water <coughs> molecules all the way through the pore, and they are all hydrogen bonded. Now, in this case, you only have three water molecules, and they are too far away from each other to form hydrogen bonds. So to us, this means very strongly that in this particular conformation, there's not a lot of water transport, water conduction going on. So this is a very inefficient water pore, if at all functional. Now again, this is a ribbon diagram. You have these three water molecules in the middle of the water pore, and then you have these big gaps between the central water and this water, which is close to the bulk solution. And so this is very different from a normal water pore, normal open water pore. And very fortunately, um, Bob Stroud at UCSF was actually able to get a 2.2 angstrom X-ray structure of octopon zero, but of the full length protein. And because it's a full length, we predicted that it wouldn't form membrane junctions, and indeed only individual tetramers crystallized in these 3D crystals. And when he determined the structure of these, it's a normal open water pore where you can see a continuous line of water molecules all the way through the water pore. And now we're in this very fortunate situation that we can actually compare the structure of the full length open water pore um, non-junction water uh, protein with the cleaved junction of point zero in the closed conformation. And now we can start to actually answer some questions. The first question is, if you cleave on the cytoplasmic side, why do you induce the formation of a membrane junction up here? And so this is the full length protein from the X-ray structure. And what you can see is that the end terminus is nicely popped back into this little hydrophobic pocket formed by these transmembrane arthrohelices. And the same is true for the C-terminus. You have this interaction network that links the C-terminus to the transmembrane arthrohelices. In addition, you have a cross-link between the end terminus and the C-terminus. So this is a full-length protein in the young fiber cell. Now you age the, 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 the fiber cells, the protein ages, and you get many um, for the little cleavages, and the main cleavages are actually right here and here. And once you cleave this, what you lose is the interaction of the end terminus with these, with these transmembrane arthrohelices, and the interaction of the C terminus with these transmembrane arthrohelices, and also the cross-link you lose. So this liberation of the end of the C terminus through a mechanism that we do not understand actually leads a conformation chain in loop A from this conformation into this conformation. And this is a very important conformational change. 
So this is the axis structure of the full length non junction of the prime zero. And you have three important decisions. So this is prime 38, which should actually be in the sense to make this junction that I've shown you before. In addition, we have an alternate here, which is nicely plugged in between the interface of these two subunits. In addition, you have the strip to firm, and the strip to firm is actually sticking out of the surface of the tetramer and interferes with the approach of the second tetramer to actually make a docking. So you get circular uh, hindrance. Now, if you cleave the N and the C terminus, this loop A here actually moves from this side to this side. And what happens in effect is that the tryptophan and the alginin just simply switch the position. So the alginin goes from the interface of these two subunits over the entrance of the waterfall and actually helps to block the waterfall. While the tryptophan, which was sticking out, just simply talks itself in between the interface of these two subunits and no longer interferes with the approach of the second tetrama. And finally, the proline, which is in an awkward situation here, comes into the center to form this little ring, which is required to make a membrane junction. And once you have made this conformational change from this side to this side, it's no longer a problem to actually put a second tetramer on top, and all the three sub uh, deciduous engage in membrane junction forming interactions. So these two alginates interact with a water molecule, these tryptophans make um, stacking interactions, and this, this protein um, Rosetta shown you before. So once you caught the C and the N terminus, you make this membrane junction. Next question, once you form the membrane junctions, why do you actually close the waterfall? And initially, at our three axon structure, we actually thought it would be alternate in the Holland 87, which would be responsible for closing the waterfall. The reason we thought so was that this alternate is part of a very important site. It's called the R R constriction site. R stands for aromatic resilience, this vanilla name, and R is the alternate. And this is actually the narrowest part of the waterfall, and this constriction site is responsible when only water can go throughout the point, throughout the point and no bigger molecules. So this is a very, very narrow um, constriction site. And all of the points determined to this state, this alternate was always in the same conformation. But in the alternate, in our junction of the point zero, this alternate actually moved a little bit further into the form and we thought that this little bit movement would be sufficient to close the waterfall. And so we got some, so this is what we proposed based on the three Einstein structure, and we got some confirmation for this theory from molecular dynamic simulation using upper point Z, which is the waterfall from E. coli. And so the structure of upper point Z was determined again by Bob Squire at UCSF, and in the asymmetric unit of the crystal, you have two tetramers. And if the two tetramers, the conformation of this alginate, which corresponds to the R constriction site, was actually different. And one tetramer, this alginate, was actually pointing out, uh, pointing out, similar to all the other alginates alginate found in all the other structures. But in the second tetramer, this alginate was pointing down very similar to what we found in our closed upper point zero. And so what Kyle Schulten's group did was to run some molecular dynamic simulations, and what they found is that these two conformations can really switch back and forth, and they can do this very quickly. So it's like an ion channel which has probabilities being open and closed. So it was very close to what we actually predicted. And furthermore, what they found is sometimes the alternate actually moves from the open to the down conformation, and it stayed down. And when it stayed down, it completely emptied the waterfall with a suggestion that the down conformation would be the closed waterfall. So we were very, very happy when we saw this, and then we were very distressed when we actually looked at Bob Stroud's structure again. So this is the alginate in our closed upper point zero, and this is the alginate in the open upper point zero, and you can see it's exactly the same conformation. So what this means is that the conformation change of this alginate can actually not be the cause of open and closing the water point of the point zero. There, there must be some other mechanism. And so when we looked a little bit close at these four lining residues, what we found is that it's this methane in 176, right above this R, R constriction <coughs> site, that actually is in a completely different conformation in the open and the closed form. And you can see this further in the density map. So this would be the R, R constriction site in the open form. This is the alginate, this is the phenylalanine, and this looks exactly the same in the closed and in the open form. What is different is this methane in 176. In the open pole, this methane in 176 sort of lines the water pole, the rim of the water pole, and by doing so, allows two water molecules to be in the water pole. 
But what happens when the pole closes is that this methionine actually moves into the pole and by doing so replaces these two water molecules and actually creates this big gap between the outside water and the inside water. And that's what we propose is actually closing the water for an upper point zero, but this methionine is only conserved in upper points from different species, upper point zero from different species, but not in other upper points. So this mechanism, if it's true, is very specific for upper point zero. So the last point I want to make is when you look at crystals, 2D crystals, they're usually formed by protein-protein interactions. And so when we looked at the packing of upper point zero, we actually didn't find any specific protein-protein interactions. So the question became, what is actually holding these 2D crystals together? And so we decided to look in between these tetramers, just at this level of density, in between the two tetramers, and instead of looking from the top, we're now going to look for the side. And if we do this, we find these four layers of elongated densities here. And what those actually represent are lipid molecules. And so now what we could do is actually make an atomic model of these lipid bilayers. And so now we have a really fairly complete atomic model of a lipid bilayer. And because we have now the protein as well as the lipids, we can actually look at protein-lipid interactions. And one of the things I want to point out is that most of these lipids are actually sandwiched in between two tetramers. And this sandwiching of these lipids is probably the reason that they are very constrained in their movement and in their mobility, and this might be the reason why we're actually able to model these lipid molecules. And so for each subunit here, we could model nine different lipid molecules, more or less complete, and what we found was that seven of these lipids were in direct contact with the proteins, or so-called annual lipids, and two more of the lipids are not in direct contact with the protein and represent both lipids. And so we can now really look in detail at these protein-lipid interactions and what we find are three layers of interactions. So the first layer of interaction is between the hydrophobic acid chains of the lipid with the hydrophobic residuals and the hydrophobic belt of the protein. And so that's not really surprising, this is well predicted. But sometimes these lipids actually have very strange conformations. So for example, this lipid splays its, its acid chains very far apart. And this acid chain makes actually very tight connections with different clusters of aromatic residues on this side. While the other acid chain on this side actually weaves its way through this little cluster of five isolucents. So there are much more intricate interactions between the protein and the acid chains than what we predicted before. So this is the first layer of interaction. And then the second layer of interaction is up here. And it's known for quite a while that at the interface between the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic part of the membrane protein, you find these aromatic residues. And what we find is that these aromatic residues actually very often interact with the glycerol backbone of the lipid molecules. And that makes sense because the glycerol also is the interface between the hydrophobic acid chains and the hydrophilic um, head group. So this is the second layer of interaction. <coughs> and then the third layer of interaction you find in the positive charge head group of the colons which often interact with positively charged side um, chains of the protein. So what I want to point out here is that protein-lipid interactions have been described before. Very often in crystal structures of membrane proteins, you actually find lipid molecules. But these lipid molecules are purified all the way through the purification procedure from the native membrane into the crystal. So these are very tightly bound lipids, very specific bound lipids. In this case, our components don't have specifically bound lipids. So what we're looking at are the DMPC molecules that we use for reconstitution. So what we're looking at here are actually unspecific, non-specific protein-lipid interactions, the way any membrane protein is actually embedded in a lipid bilayer. And what is interesting is that the interactions of these non-specifically bound lipids are very, very similar to the interactions described for the specifically bound lipids. So there's actually not much difference. And so I want to summarize my talk, you probably have seen this, you are sick of it by now. So this is a slab of density through the density map. In blue is upper point zero. In red in the middle is the water molecule in the center of the membrane. And the whole thing is surrounded by the lipid molecules uh, which form the, the electric seal around the proteins. And with this I would like to end and just acknowledge the people who actually did the work. So pretty much all the work was done by Tommy Gorman, who was a postdoc in the group, he now is a group leader at the University of Washington, Seattle. 
He got a lot of help from Yifan Chang, who used to be our EM manager. Actually, right today, he flew to San Francisco to start his own group now at UCSF. And then Piotr, um, so a lot of this was actually borrowed methods from exocrystallography. So we did molecular replacement, we did high resolution refinement. And so we needed people from exocrystallography to help us. And Piotr did a fantastic job doing the molecular replacement. And Steve Harrison really helped us through the high resolution refinement. The model protein that we used to purify the protein was, uh, was sent, or the lenses were sent from Georg Pistler from the University of Auckland, and since he's in New Zealand, that's the reason I just showed you the structure of sheep of the one zero. And then finally, in Kyoto, Kyoto Hiroki was very important because she actually fixed the microscope every time we messed it up. And then Yoshi, we really adapted to not only for giving us access to this fantastic microscope, but it was really his guidance and his advice that allowed us to get to this very high resolution data collection. So these are the people who did all the work, these are all the credit, and thank you. So if you want this new data, the atomic Boltzmann course could be, if you give me another two minutes, three minutes. Thank you. So, <coughs> Um, Simon Scheuer in Paris actually sent an email a year ago and asked me whether we could send him some, some membranes. And so it didn't cost us more, and we just sent them some lens membranes as well from the call. And then we didn't hear anything for a long time, and then at some point he said, well, send us some more membranes. We sent some more membranes. And literally two weeks later, an email came with these images, which I think are very spectacular. So this is a membrane patch isolated from the, from the um, lens core, and what you can see is the lipid bilayer here, and the case that there was some stuff stuck to this lipid bilayer. And what you can do with the, electron, with the atomic walls microscope, you can take the tip and just scratch the stuff off. And once you scratch the stuff off this little pack here, what you start to see are these little densities, these, these lattices, and what this actually is, is upper point zero, two crystals in a native lens membrane. And what you can see is alpha point zero is just randomly distributed. It forms these, these little islands, which form these membrane junctions, because you simply remove the top layer of this membrane junction. And then you zoom in a little bit further, you can very nicely now see the alpha point zero 2D crystal. And what is very nice is that these are mixed junctions, because you have alpha point zero junctions in the middle. And these things are surrounded by this sort of rough looking stuff. And what this actually is a gap junction. So you have these mixed junctions, and what we can now do, or what actually what Simon's poster did, is to zoom in into this area here and get a high resolution topograph. And so this is the raw image, this is after averaging and after focal summarization. And what we can now do is actually we can try to figure out what is the conformation of aqua point zero in these native membranes, in these membrane <coughs> junctions. And as I mentioned, if you have one junction of full length aqua point zero, you have this confirmation of loop A. When you have junction of point zero, this loop makes a confirmation change and moves over to this confirmation. What we can do now is we can compare the crystal structure and the confirmation of the structure of the exercise side of the crystal structure with the AFM topographs. And what we can see is that we get very nice um, mid, um, match of these two densities here, which would be loop C. But in this case, we don't get a match of this loop A in the non-junction form with this surface topograph. If we now calculate the structure from the junction of point zero, we actually get a much better fit with this particular loop here. So we actually think that by using AFM on native membranes, we can actually figure out what the conformation of the protein is in the native membrane. And so what this tells us is that it's really the cleavage that comes first and then changes the loop and makes the membrane junction. Because even if you now remove the top layer, this loop stays in the same conformation. So this, 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 it's not the junction formation that induces the conformation change, it's a conformation change that allows the junction formation. And so this was done, so Rich, who is here, actually purified the membranes for this, and the whole work was done by atomic force microscopy by Nikolai Brzezinski and Simon Schreins uh, at the Institute of Curie in Paris. So can they digest the C and then do I have them? Do you have a side? So they go much like that. Yes. So P 
leave the That's why it forms this member junction. You first have to remove the top layer, and then you can only. Thank you very much, it was fantastic.